I'm Stefan Bauman, and welcome to another podcast. What you're about to witness is actually a critique that took place in October at a plein air workshop I had in Las Vegas. Now, I know you're saying Las Vegas. No, this is outside of Las Vegas. It's at the Hoover Dam, and we spent three days painting in extraordinary places. Southern Nevada is a beautiful place, a very inspirational place to paint. And this particular podcast deals with painting at night, or what we call nocturne painting. Now, oftentimes we think, oh, we need a special preparation, we need all this stuff. Actually, it's really quite easier. It's easier to paint at night than it is during the day. We talk about some of the secrets that we have in doing that. But before we get into that, indulge me just for a moment and watch video I put together about the book that I just published. And I promise you, once that's over with, we will get back to Nocturne Painting. So enjoy the video. I'm Stefan Bauman, and I would love to introduce you to a new book that I just wrote on plein air painting. After 40 years, I finally sat down with one of the best authors that I could possibly imagine for this project and put together everything I know about painting outdoors. And this isn't just an outdoor painting book, no. These are techniques that you can bring into the studio and they apply to watercolors, acrylics, gouache, and oil. You will be amazed at what you will learn with every turn of the page, every paragraph. We have worked through my videos, my information, my books, my blogs, and brought it all together. And over two years of editing, we brought it down to just the facts. This painting book has over 400 pages and almost 500 illustrations. If you see my videos, and if you read my blog, and you follow me on YouTube, you know that there's a lot of information. There's a lot of things you don't know that you don't know. I'm amazed at the quality of this book, the pages. It's a field guide. It's a book that you would take outdoors with you and paint on location. It's been organized so you could find your way through my keys. This book explains 40 years of teaching and knowledge one-on-one. -on -one. All the information that I possibly know about painting is in this book. So run, don't walk, and order this book today. Get this book. It's awesome! Yay! <laughs> so day two of the, of the workshop here. And... There are a few things. We're going to have a critique about the nocturne paintings that we did last night. And uh, those of you who did the nocturne, but it is awesome. The, the great thing about doing nocturne paintings is that you don't really have to do anything. And like Stephen was saying, it's like the light isn't changing. It just sits there. So it's like being in the still life. So you're not chasing after anything. It's a very calming experience. And then, of course, you know, we're in the biggest air. And it was just warm, nice, no wind. It was just a really beautiful experience. Mm -hmm. You want to have a light bulb somewhere, a, a light bulb somewhere, light happening on a thing. You don't want to be looking for the glowing sky and star. Because yeah. that's just not exciting. What's exciting is the casino light out in front with all of those lights and illuminating the air. That's what you'll see when you start painting nocturnes, is that there's usually moisture in the air at night, and then you have that beautiful luminescent um, light that just, you know, just transforms everything. You just put that, you have a dark background, and then you put the highlight in there. So whose painting is that? It would be Lynette's. Lynette's? Yes. Is, that must be like the very first time you went outdoors and painted the night. Yes. But when you start doing it, firstly, you got to get the canvas covered. And so a lot of people have book lights and headlights. And for the most part, some of you started off that way. Some of you may have finished that way. But pretty much a lot of people just start turning those lights off. Once your canvas is covered, you pretty much can kind of see the values. The main thing is, is that you want to have your paints a little organized. So when you have white, you want to have your lemon yellow, because uh, that's what you're going to use for your highlight. 
you're going to have your lemon yellow somewhere else. You go, okay, that's my yellow because they look exactly the same in that light. And then you're looking at burnt umber and ultramarine blue, and they look the same in the dark. So you kind of have to like remember if you master this temperature thing that I'm trying to coach you on, if you master that, you pretty much will be able to be in at night and understand how to do it without having any light. You can actually paint in the dark. The great thing about painting in the dark like that is that when you start putting your highlights on, you can actually see the light glowing on the painting. It's like you know what color it is. You know you're using lemon yellow and white. And as you're putting it on, you can see the contrast. So you're not really worried about whether or not it's the right color or not. You're just going to have to believe. But that's the beauty about, the, about doing the temperature thing. It will always work if you always remember that everything you paint that's dark is warm. Everything in the dark. So when you look at the background, you're looking at like ultra blue, brown, backgrounds. Now, the reason why we don't use black is because black is just one solid color, which is holy. And so what you do is you mix ultramarine blue and brown, which is the default of shadow. And you paint right out of the tube, and you start painting your back of the sky as you Now, with this theory that brown, we're using more colors, we're using the back. Probably for a number of ultramarine. Yeah, probably so. Because yeah, you can see it's brownish. And then, yeah, it's got almost the same color. So what you want to do when you're doing a background for a nocturne is get that one color form. So what you'll want to do is you'll want to start off with a brown and ultramarine, and then go with more ultramarine, less brown, and then go with more you know, brown and ultramarine. You want to kind of go back and forth so that you um, undulate, so that the black just doesn't look like you spray paint. Then, so ultramarine blue and burnt umber create a warm brown tone, warm black tone. So what I suggest is take Viridian green, pale red rose, and make it cool black, just as a cool black color. And what I like to do is actually take that warm brown and go into that cool black, just to kind of create the temperature change in the sky, because otherwise it's just boring. And so you'd actually get a little bit of a cooler black, and then a browner black, and then a bluer black. And so the background now has options. There's just this feeling that, that the sky has got all kinds of things going and working with temperatures, all the same value, but there's a change in there. And then to offer even more variety, you could use some of that more thaler red rose, in that too. So now you have four different colors undulating in the back of the sky. So you don't, it doesn't look like you just spread it with one tone. Uh, that's why we're going out tonight again, so that you can practice some more of this. Just remember that everything's a variation of red, yellow, and blue. So when you have these artists that are purists and they go, oh, always use and understand the complementary colors when whatever you do is like always use the color. Well, if you have three colors, and you mix a color, you always got one color left that's a complementary color. If you take these two colors, you always have one color left that's a complementary color. It's like you don't have to sit and study all these complementary colors if you keep your colors you know, separate. The temperature thing is much more exciting because they're within temperatures. So you'll hear ours go, oh, value is so important. Learn your values. There's a lot of values and values. Values take all of the the, the thing. They say, okay, but when you learn temperature, values takes the backseat. That temperature is really where it rocks. Temperature causes you to paint at night and not have to see the values. Um, so the lighting effect that's on here, you just kind of went through it, just put light. And the sheer, the beautiful thing about painting at night and working with lights is that it's that contrast between lights and shadows. And I guarantee if you don't know temperatures, Night painting is horrible because it will all look muddy. It will all look muddy. It all is based around temperature. What's lacking in here is a central focal point. Now, when the building is lit like this, you've got to add things to the um, transitions 
so that you know you say okay in the middle third is where I'm we want our painting. Where I just call them a light, the ones in the middle there have a little more white, a little brighter, but not enough probably to draw it. Yeah, just, well you do have like this a little brighter over here, <laughs> yes, that's and that right. is pulling you know, your our attention off into here. This should have got a little darker. This could have got a little bit darker, but then that's why you you have your your studio to work on. But, but really, I like the flag the best. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. it's cool. But uh, yeah, again, uh, you want to make sure when you're going out painting yeah. something, you want a foreground, middle ground, background. And so what's, it would have been nice is for you to be across the parking lot a little more. So we actually saw the whole building <coughs> in here. Yeah. And this is such a beautiful building. It's like a castle. And so if you got back and you painted this castle in these lights with all these darks. And yesterday, um, the, the sky was so clear. And as the, um, the blackness came down, we had that beautiful glowing blue on the ridge. <clears throat> you know, so a beautiful glowing glow. And so as you came down, you could have uh, added like a little sense of a mountain here. And then you put that blue. Now remember, you're working all in warms. And that color that you see that's illuminating behind the mountains, that blue, that's actually light. So whenever you're trying to think of what color you need to use, if you use the word light, it's going to be cool. So you would do ultramarine blue and burnt umber all in here, and then if you wanted to get that illuminated light behind the mountains, you would take cerulean blue, which is a cool blue, on top of your ultramarine, which is a warm blue, and you would just kind of mix that in, and you would have gotten that really illuminated. If you would have just taken ultramarine blue and added white, it's, it would have failed. But there are ultramarine blue really lacks color. And it's mainly just a shadow tone. People don't know that. When um, you know, a lot of companies do these azure light paints, it's like, oh, it's real azure light. It's like, oh, you must have the. This is what Rembrandt used and Vermeer used. It's really useless. Yeah, you know, just because it's like you think it's like a mineral or a stone. You pay $150 for this little tiny tube, and most artists don't know what to do with it. They add white to it because they think, oh, it's going to be this big, wonderful blue, and it's just like, no, it's not. It's actually just a really good shadow color. So, um, yeah, any of those colors not worth anything. A lot of colors are not worth anything when it comes right down to it. First thing, colors are overrated. Colors usually ruin paintings. The only thing that you really want to do when you're adding colors, if you're going to go like super modern, you know, big bold colors and orange and stuff like that, then color has a, has a way. But if you look at most paintings, they're usually variations of browns and grays and toned down and then you know, illuminated light of some kind. But the Mona Lisa is almost monochromatic. You know, it's like a lot of Rembrandt paintings are almost monochromatic. There's very little color in them. So it doesn't take a lot of color to, to have the eye finish off. You think when you see the Mona Lisa, you think that she's actually full of color. But she's actually just a facade. A little bit of color just in the highlighted areas. And those colors are cool. Most of her face is warm. I don't know why artists sit and paint brown as a shadow and call it cool. I have no idea. But this here could have had more interest in it by shifting the you other know, graves. It was wonderful. Um, not bad, and it didn't take you long. And once you got going, you kind of set in the right direction. Okay, so. So, obviously, you know what you got in trouble for. Yeah. What did he get in trouble for? Size. Size. <laughs> he ends up painting like it's one of his best paintings ever, and he's painting on this puny little bathroom painting. <laughs> Can you see why, you know, he could have had a major painting that, you know, for a competition, he would have just up But uh, nonetheless, so what were you thinking? I thought this scene was actually really fascinating, just like with the stop sign and the parked car. It's nothing that I would ever be compelled to paint for any other reason. Uh, other than it being nighttime, um, and in that light, it was fascinating. Yeah, I mean, you would have never ever. 
Yeah, that's the great thing about nocturne paintings, is that you can't really go out there thinking, like your painting would have bombed in a, in a daytime painting. The thing that you've got to realize, and this is like the core, core theory of my book, the core theory of my teaching, is that you can paint crap, but if you put in a central focal point that's the effect of light, it's like, ta-da! It could be the worst composition, it could be the worst scene, and guess what, when you're working with light, it's all effects. It's all about the lighting effects, because you can't see the objects. So when you're painting this, this is all lighting effects. And when you bring lighting effects, it stimulates viewers, and they go, oh, I love that, because they've seen it. Every night they go out for a walk, and they see it. They see the lamppost in this, and they see the glow in the car, they see. Like I said, this is not a, a scene that would work during the day. Because there's, and you can even put effects on it, but it's just a shitty composition. Right. But you get a source of light, and then look at uh, out of all this, it's that one little light that pulls it all together. So once I was in San Diego doing the plain air convention, and all of a sudden this woman is just screaming. Ah! And it was like the first day of the convention they were going to paint, and she was just all ego, 100% ego. I'm not sure she told her husband, I'm going to spend a thousand dollars going to this convention, and I'm going to produce such wonderful work. And we went out there, and it was just on the outside of the hotel at the casino, and she's painting, and she's having a hissy fit. You know those fits that kids have at Walmart when they don't get their toy? Well, she's screaming like this, and of course, you know, her best friend is totally embarrassed. And then, you know, a couple of us with hats, you know, our instructors come over, and they're all just kind of like consoling her, telling her, it's not a bad painting. Oh, it's good. You may move a little bit of the palm trees over there. I mean, I was just sitting there listening to them. And so I walked up to her, and you know, she was making a commotion. People were thinking she was slaughtering cats over there. So, so I walked over, and I said, so can I take your brush? And she said, yeah, I hate it too long. So I said, okay. okay. So what was it about this that you wanted to paint? really kind of stupid choice to begin with. And she said, well, there were palm trees, and then the light was on San Diego back there. And it was like, I kind of wanted to do that. So I said, I'm going to make a mark on the canvas. And she says, oh, go ahead. You can't ruin it. It's so bad. So I pick up this little quarter-inch brush, flat, and I go in, and I pick a nice, bright, cool color. I think it was really well and white. And it was just almost white, but it was really cool. And right between the palm trees, I made a brush drum that was probably, it was probably a quarter of an inch by quarter of an inch. It was almost square. It was just a little downstroke, like this. And I looked at it and I said, damn, I'm impressed. It was like the thing that it needed. It was it needed that central focal point. And I just, put down the brush and kind of step back. And everybody was like going, ah, oh, wow. You know, it was just like, and she's like, oh, thank you, thank you. But it was just that one mark in the right place. And when we were doing the critiques yesterday, you saw that when I was working on Stephen's painting, you had Stephen's painting, and I said, here we need some light here, and here we need some light here, and all of a sudden the painting became big. Because there is a fact that this little effect, if that wasn't there, we wouldn't have that one element to catch your eye. Meanwhile, we have the other uh, elements in here. Um, that's a little, little jam. I would like to have seen, again, you know, it's like having three central focal points. I would like to have seen the light on the car brighter and a little light on the stop sign. So you would have had the three, but these two can't be as bright as that. So the first thing, you know, when you're painting, can you see can you see the lapping of all the brush strokes? Lap, lap? Yeah. I mean, I'm sure it's like back there it's all just you gotta make sure that when you're putting brush strokes in, that every brush stroke is unique. So even if you're doing background like this, one long one, short one, one drag this way, a couple short this way, 
Do you want to have the, the application of paint to be interesting? It would have been good to have some variations of your, your colors in here. Yeah, a night painting is about the effective light and the reflective light and stuff. I think you work way too small on a big canvas. I would like to have seen you have a little bit more. Did you take a photograph of it first and then edit the photograph? I did. Sure, I did. Yes. Yes. Get more into it. Let's get, you saw Steve, he filled up his canvas with this yes. thing. Yes. And we looked at the hotel oh, and he filled up the canvas here. Oh, what were you uh, thinking? Fabulous. I just like the I just like the light off the truck. Yeah, it really yeah, is yeah. Cool. Yeah. fabulous. Yes. Yeah, it's got really big bold strokes. It's like you you know, you kind of took a challenge. You gave us a foreground. Is there a sense of place? Yeah, we're just getting into the car. You know, so we really kind of feel that way. And then what's interesting is the effect of light coming through the windows and the effect of light in the sign with all of the, the dark in there. See, that's what night painting is, is to find those unusual things. It was fun. It was fun. It was fun. Yeah. Um, and were you hesitant to go out? Or were you looking forward to it? I was looking forward to it because, you know, Gardnerville has some neat old bars and casinos, and but mm -hmm. I just haven't. Lights. But I tell you, you can go into the most stupidest town mm -hmm. and you could find something interesting mm -hmm. with the lighting effect. You know, just a just a light post with the car parked underneath it. It's like, it's, and the thing is, everybody loves them. Everybody loves them because they're just luminous effects. Remember, we don't paint things, we paint effects. And what's better is the light effect on at night. You know? Last year we had pools of water because it just rained before we went out. And the reflections of the light in the water was just stunning. You know, it's just like on steroids. Um, but yeah, that's a very successful night painting. Is this your first night painting? Second. Second. The getting? other one was exactly like you described. I tried to do the light on the valley, mm -hmm. but it was boring. When I did the plein air convention, and I had in Tucson, and they asked me if I would teach the night painting um, session because the gal they had listed and advertised for, Broker Lake Skiing. So, so they said, oh, we don't have a night painter. And then Eric said, ah, call Steph and help. <laughs> so I went down there and I'm like thinking, oh yeah, and it was a full moon when we had it. So I went out the night before and I drove around in the desert till I could find a really beautiful cactus and you know rocks and a full moon and you know the road going through it. And I did a really beautiful full moon painting out, you know, in some suburb somewhere. I had no idea where I was. Um, and I get back and I did the demo copying that painting to tell them what it was. And the following day I was supposed to take the plein air painters out at night. And at that point I was like, oh well, where's the landscape in there? Because I'm primarily a landscape painter, you know. And so they said, oh, just take them out in the, the casino parking lot out there. And I went out there and they had all these uplights and palm trees and, you know, glowing mountains and stuff. And it was, every painting turned out great. I don't know if it's because I gave such a good demo, or if it was just because the lighting effect just always comes out good. This is so. just so much fun. Yeah. Sorry. So, whose is this? It's mine. Who's mine? Me. <laughs> it's just a side of the sign, and then that light there. Mm-hmm. And then so, it was illuminating everything, and I didn't get the lights in. I started to put them in, and then we went in. But I was going to do like a lot of lemon yellow rose yeah. in the. Yeah. So, so the thing is, what you kind of have to get that you're you're communicating to a viewer that doesn't know you from anything. Right. Okay. They don't know what you're painting. They don't know, and so they come across this painting, and they see these squiggly lines. There's nothing that you can, you know. Pull off, and when I came over and saw you, what you were doing, I was like, "Good luck with all of that." <laughs> yeah, it would have been easier just to paint a palm tree. <laughs> I should just but this is like this is like the middle of the sign, and then the casino sign is on this side and on this side. Well, who kind of looks at the middle of the sign? <laughs> but it could have been great if you pulled it off. You know, if you took a photograph of it, you could tell what it was. Yeah. But on your painting, you didn't quite get. You didn't pull it off. Yeah. And then, you know, the area of light, you got these lines, so the viewer's trying to figure out what those lines were. When in essence, they're kind of reproducing 
bulbs facing the other direction. Yeah. So I think this one failed just because we were looking for overly complicated things. Yeah. We would have been better off just to paint what Steve did. Right, right. Said. He was sitting next to me, and I'm like, what? Is yeah, he's looking at a phone. When you're doing a workshop like this, you don't want to paint this something there. You know, it's kind of like I want to teach you how to paint at night. And everything that we do, it's like, okay, go out there and do it. Come back, let's assess it, figure out what's not working. And then we go out tonight. And you might make better choices. See, if you make it to one of our workshops, you too can get an opportunity to paint in some of the most extraordinary places in America and do a little nocturne painting. If you wish to get more information about my workshops, you could do so at www.stephenbauman.com. And there you can download a free book on painting. And you can get more information about the book that I just published, Everything You Need to Know About Painting Outdoors. It is just full of information for anybody that's painting in a studio or outdoors. It's a field guide. There's so there's over 400 pages in that book, 500 illustrations. Believe me, it will put you to sleep every night and you'll wake up better for it. If you want to get information about coaching, just give me a call at 415-606-9074. Between you and me, you won't get to the next level unless you find yourself a coach. It doesn't have to be me but I'm probably the least expensive and the most interesting to listen to. So come along with me and become one of my coaching students. If that's just out of the question, try Patreon. That's actually what you listened in to partially is my Patreon group. So try Patreon. It might work better. So go to www.patreon. Look for Stefan Bauman. But until then, always remember to paint with passion and always remember... Don't run around your studio with scissors. You might get hurt. Have a great time painting. Talk to you later.